with that said, I'm going to start off with uh, our very good friend and very, um, he's been just a wonderful asset to all everybody's organization. He's just been gracious, uh, beyond gracious with his time, his uh, valuable space on the Skeptic Zone podcast to be able to promote other people, other works and so on. And um, this is our very good friend, Richard Saunders, who has the most unusual background in the world because it is devoted to him getting the best sound out of that amazing microphone that <laughs> he has. As And it just, re the, the absorption, I understand he has towels all over the place and he's like, he squeezes his cats to keep them from meowing or something like I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> but it's a, it's a fantastic uh, podcast. Uh, Adrian's on it. Rob Palmer's on it. I'm occasionally asked to be on it. It's phenomenal <laughs> and uh, weekly and definitely check it out. So I'm going to turn this over to Richard. Well, I was just about to say, Susan, you don't have to go anywhere. I'm not oh. going to share a screen and you well, can hang out I with me. I'll make faces, and I don't know if that's a good idea, because I'll be like, all right, <laughs> I'm going to let you have it. I, if you want me back, Thank I'm you. back. I'm sure you'll be back soon towards the end of my half hour, so we can take some questions and have a I, chat, because I, you were I, involved. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everybody. What a pleasure it is to be with the Monterey Skeptics. Once again, one of the last skeptic camps I attended live in person was in, um, in Monterey, two years ago when it be in the before times in the before times and we didn't know i had a wonderful day i gave a talk about general skepticism and uh i noticed too i just appeared in in the local newspaper again as a, as a member of the group so i'm i'm very touched about that you know i really feel like i'm a part of it which which is just fantastic what what happy memories i'm going to be talking about briefly the the Great Australian Psychic Prediction Project. And some people here joining us today were certainly a vital part of that. Now, for those of you who don't know, this was an attempt to get a good understanding as to the accuracy of so-called psychics when they make their yearly predictions about the year or the decade or, or what is to come. The object was to see how accurate the claims were for those who said they could see the future using magic or psychics or spirits or something unknown to science. Now, prophecy and prediction has been part of human society since the day dot. I mean, various religions certainly have many prophecies and predictions woven into their mythology. Uh, the book of Revelation, for example, in the Bible. And we can understand why Humans with our big imaginations can, uh, as far as we know, we're the only species that have a truly reasonable understanding that there is a future and what might happen in the future, uh, thanks to our large brains. And it's hardly surprising that in early civilizations there came about people who thought they could see events that were to come. You can understand how important this would be for predicting next year's crops or would the the crew about to launch out in the fishing boat or whatever it is have a successful catch if they didn't the, the, the tribe might die knowing the future was very important so fast forward over the millennia various religions as i say have prophecies and predictions and i think you'd agree with me that the most uh, famous popular person in modern culture going back some centuries would be nostradamus i'm sure you've all heard about nostradamus Excuse me if I have to <coughs> pause every now and then. I've just had a slight bout of bronchitis, not COVID. I've had five negative tests, so it's not, not COVID. Who could have predicted that? Nostradamus, who was very popular in, in, in popular culture, certainly in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, then he began to peter out. And you don't hear much about Nostradamus, not like you used to when I was younger. And we can speculate as to why that is, probably because a lot of his predictions simply just didn't come true when examined, they didn't come true, and these fads, these fads come and go. But still today, his name is recognized and known and remembered as a great seer. There's still certainly a lot of people who still believe in the, the prophecies of Nostradamus. If you haven't read the book, the Mask of Nostradamus by James Randi. 
make it your next uh, book to read. It's a terrific examination of what Nostradamus actually said, why he said it. James Randi did a, a, a wonderful job. So now let's fast forward to our recent history. And at the end of the year here in Australia, the December, January period, the Christmas break, and I'm sure it's the same wherever you're listening or seeing this uh, today. TV shows, magazines, will certain ones will have psychics. They'll wheel in the psychic to say, what's coming up for the next 12 months? What do you see? And normally, normally it's to do with celebrities. And as we work through the 3,811 predictions that we marked in this project, the biggest such undertaking ever taken, uh, undertaken, uh, undertaking ever undertaken, we discovered that a huge bulk of predictions published in Australia in, over a 20 year period, the years 2000 to uh, 2020, were about celebrities. And that's what you normally get in magazines, on TV shows, what's happening. And we discovered that Nicole Kidman came up number one person or subject predicted about. A person. The subject was celebrities, but she was the number one person predicted about. It's gossip. People who watch morning TV, chat shows, read magazines, whatever, these sort of magazines, uh, these shows are, are largely based around gossip. And gossip is a very interesting part of uh, the human makeup, the psychology. It's to do with getting inside information about people. Why did gossip evolve? Why do we listen to rumors? It's to gain a little bit of in, uh, information that may benefit us ultimately. This has turned, it's evolved into a great curiosity. What did you hear? Did you hear about Susan Gerbeck? Well, let me tell you. Suddenly, your brain is going, bing, 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 I want to hear. What, what's this? What's happening? You all know that feeling. So if a psychic come come along and talk about someone that you might admire, a movie star or a TV star or something like that, a politician, and say, listen, I've got some inside information next year, I foresee, you can see how that, that's interesting. And of course, the TV shows and the magazines pick up on this, it's business. Now, ultimately, they don't care. It's just a five, 10 minute segment or columns in a magazine. The editor, the producers, they don't care if it's true or not. The segment fills a gap in the show, column in inches, Let's move on to the next show. Don't get, don't get confused here. They're not in the business of fact. They're in the business of entertainment. And that's, that's far more important. Anyway, so we had this, I had this project in mind 20 years ago. So I began to collect, how, how am I gonna, what am I gonna do? How, how can I judge? I know I'll collect as many predictions as I can published since the year 2000. This was years and years ago, 2010. So I began collecting and I thought, I remember their predictions made in magazines, New Idea, Women's Weekly, uh, Women's Day, uh, the, whatever magazines here in Australia, more or less focused for the female audience. And I thought, well, I seem to remember when I go to the doctor, there's some magazines. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find some predictions there. But it soon occurred to me that if I was going to do this properly, I would have to do it thoroughly. So I ended up going to state libraries, various state libraries here in Australia, where they have the, uh, the job of uh, archiving these magazines and so on, newspapers and whatever. So I spent many, many, many hours here in Sydney pouring through thousands of pages of these magazines, flipping through, looking for, here is the psychic column, here is the prediction from this psychic. I would catalog those and keep going. Then I spent a week in Melbourne uh, with my good friend, Dr. Steve Roberts, who is uh, one of Australia's skeptics, uh, leading UFO experts. Uh, and we spent a wonderful time. What a happy time it was going to the library there and pouring through the magazines they had. Because we'd pour through the magazines all morning, go out and have a long lunch. Mm -hmm. Wow. It was so much fun. Stagger back somehow to the library and keep going. But what a, what, what a happy time that was. Anyway, so that was collecting predictions. Also 
collecting predictions from online newspaper archives, very important. Collecting predictions from the psychic's own websites where the date could be verified. And this is where the Wayback Machine from uh, the Internet Archive is just such a vital tool in this work. I could go back to a psychic's web page and look to see when they published the prediction and what it was before they changed the prediction to match what actually happened, which did happen occasionally. And I had thousands of interesting little points I collected from magazines, archives, newspapers, as they were published, TV and radio. I've got hours and hours and hours of psychics on TV and radio I've collected over decades, which went into this project and they're all archived. Now it's important to note that every prediction in our database, all 3,811, and counting probably, I have the original prediction also. I, I've got a list in the database that says, this is the prediction, doo, 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 where it was predicted, who made it, uh, but I've also got the archived copy to back it up, a scan, uh, audio file, a newspaper report, something like that. So it's not, if anyone comes back and says, you just made this up, no, this is what, this is what the psychics actually said. Oh, by the way, when I use the word psychic, pretend I'm doing this. It's just a, a shortcut. This is for the people who made predictions using spiritual, occult, tarot cards, astrology. They're all just collectively called psychics for the purpose of this um, report. It doesn't mean individually they all think they have a psychic power. An astrologer, for, ex for example, reading the future in the stars may not necessarily say they're doing it with psychic powers. They think it's a science they're using. So collecting thousands of predictions then it was what do we do well we have to see if they're right wrong we have to analyze them and this is where originally with the help of some uh, skeptics here in australia i spent some weekends and soon discovered that there were thousands of predictions i th this wasn't enough susan gerbeck came to the rescue in mid 2020 where she suggested or I suggested to her, I honestly can't remember, it was a, just a, a mutually good idea, that we should try to have a, like this, a Zoom meeting, see who would come along and we could start working through predictions. We met every week from the middle of last year, July, June or July, June, I think someday, Susan knows, until just before the results were published late last year, so in December, every week. So for well over a year, year and a half, we had our regular meeting and it became our weekly get together with friends and we'd spend two hours plus, uh, and there's many people I think here watching today who are part of this. And uh, we miss it, we all miss it. It's amazing, we all miss it. Anyway, I would, we'd get together, we'd have a laugh, uh, joke about something and then we say okay here's the first prediction and I would uh, copy it from the database and put it into the chat window and we'd look at it and say well what do you think let's look and we'd have five six seven people all independently researching the historical archives where whatever we could the, the historical trends of weather what happened to this celebrity and so on and we get to a conclusion now either the prediction was correct which was normally pretty easy to find out. If somebody said, I foresee so-and-so celebrity, they're destined to have two children and they didn't, or they did, and, you know, they did, it's correct, easy. They didn't, wrong, easy. This, this is a matter of historical record. But not all predictions were that easy. Not all predictions were that easy at all. Some were very, what we called too vague along the lines of, uh, Nicole Kidman, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, Nicole Kidman, I see her having an interesting year of ups and downs. Opportunities will come her way, but sometimes she'll feel like she just has to hide from the world. It's, it, it's, it's what uh, Adrian Hill called waffle. And we had lots of waffly predictions like that. But in the end, when we decided they were waffle or too vague, or you just couldn't nail it down, they were catalogued as such too vague. The other one we had a uh, correct, wrong, 
too vague we had expected. And some predictions we decided were, well, anyone could have predicted that. In other words, and a great example is someone would predict in the coming year, I foresee earthquakes in California. I kid you not, there are predictions like that in the database. Obviously, there are going to be uh, earthquakes in California. Another great one is someone would predict, I, I, I predict uh, several volcanic eruptions around the world this year. Now, what most people don't know is there are always volcanic eruptions around the world every year. They might not make the news, sometimes they do, but they're always happening. Or they might predict a, a trend in economy. Uh, the, the interest rates will go up or something like that. But when we looked, we could see that that was absolutely happening when they made the prediction. So it was hardly a surprise. It was marked as expected. Now, the good thing about the, the expected or maybe even the too vague and sometimes the right or wrong is there was at times quite a uh, strong debate amongst us. And I thought that was a very healthy sign. We had to reason out why we thought this prediction was ultimately expected and not necessarily wrong or correct or in any, any other category. It meant that we were just not ticking boxes. I thought that was very useful. And a very few, a tiny percent were ultimately unknown. We couldn't find out whether this prediction was true, it was wrong, what, what was really the story behind it, no matter how hard we searched. And that's okay. There was, it's only a tiny percent. Now let me <coughs> just break here from, the, from the, the, the flow of what I'm talking about. And I'll read something that was in the official report. And by the way, if you go to skeptics.com.au and look at the journal link or the magazine link, you can download for free the official report about this whole project. And if you listen to the Skeptic Zone podcast about three episodes ago, two episodes ago, uh, together with Adrian Hill, we read the entire official report, which goes for an hour, explaining in detail our reasoning and our conclusions and, and what, what it's all about. But here's an interesting thing that I wrote as I was putting this together, which occurred to me. It's called The Flow of Time and Information. And in the, in the, the show, this is read out by Adrian Hill, who does a far better job of reading it out than I will. I promise you that. Golden tonsils, I tell you. The Flow of Time and Information. I'd be interested later when have, we have a brief chat what you might think about this. Modern physics knows of no way for information to go backwards in time. There might be some bizarre loophole that allows it, but there is no evidence for it. In order for an individual to have knowledge of events that are yet to happen, the information about that event would by necessity have to travel backwards in time to reach them and could only start its journey after the event or after the future event had taken place. If this were the case, the effect, the knowledge of the event yet to happen would precede the cause the event itself, contrary to the known laws of physics. If information from the future is traveling backwards in time, then why does it stop at any given point in time? That is the time when the psychic is able to access it. Does it keep on? Does it keep on forever? If so, are all events in the future broadcasting backwards in time until the Big Bang? And I'll just stop here to say that means things that this this is my talk right now. Is it now traveling backwards in time? So somebody in the past could predict that I was making this talk now. If information of a future negative event, say a house fire, did travel backwards in time, causing a prediction in the form of a warning, and that warning was acted upon with the result being the fire is averted, then there was no event from which the information could be generated. What exactly would the psychic be sensing? Although such arguments can be considered as to why future events cannot be seen, it must be remembered but that for many, if not all psychics, these points are irrelevant as they, at least in their own mind or worldview, rely on paranormal or supernatural methods which defy normal common sense and logic and remain unproven. And the note here is C. Hyman's maxim, which paraphrase goes along the lines, don't 
don't try to work out how something works until you discover that it works at all or it is, it's, it's actually happening. So that's an interesting point to ponder. These people who say they say they're seeing future events. How is the information traveling backwards in time? To us, it doesn't make sense. To them, they can simply invoke the spirits and that covers all bases, at least in their own mind. So yes, we had too vague, we had the expected. And let me get to some conclusions now, overall conclusions. There's much more to this project that's far too much to, to cram into a, a half an hour talk. I promise you that. That's why I encourage you to read the report or hear it being read to you by just going to skepticzone.tv, scrolling down, and you can play it right off the web page. You'll see that. So after all this work, after, for me, uh, 12 years of work for the team, a year and a half of, of weekly meetings with thousands of hours racked up, the ultimate conclusion, I guess you could put it down to is, is there's no reason for us to think that the psychic powers are involved because the psychics have not met the criteria of proving that they can actually see the future. The total uh, predictions I said was 3,811. Ultimately, we discovered that the ones that we could mark as correct, yes, they predicted this and it happened without being too obvious, like predicting earthquakes in California, was 11%, 11%. And we did a control group in 2017. We got, just, just guessing, we got a better score than 11%. The number of expected predictions in the whole project was about 15%. Too vague was 19%. 2% we couldn't, we just couldn't nail down. We didn't know, we couldn't find the answer. That's only 2%. So that's the unknown. <clears throat> but wrong, flat out, wrong, wrong, wrong was 53%. But the important one to remember is the 11%. And this is entirely in line with what we would expect from just guesswork, just guessing. The, the top topic, as I said before, was celebrities. You know, more predictions made about celebrities than any other topic followed a long way back uh, was politics. Political parties, uh, our prime ministers, our various leaders, even in US politics came into it a lot. Donald Trump was mentioned quite a lot, <clears throat> as you might imagine. Sport, there was a lot of predictions about sporting events. The British royal family with a few other royals thrown in like the Danish royal family or something like that. who get mentioned here in our newspapers because uh, the uh, future queen of Denmark is, was actually uh, born in here in Australia. So we sort of say, great. Um, sorry, Rob Palmer. <clears throat> I can hear him <laughs> grinding his teeth at the moment. But Rob, let me uh, come chime back in and say another big topic was natural disasters, which Rob really liked researching about cyclones and hurricanes and things like that. Uh, and terrorism was also got, got a big mention. So again, all I can say is there's so much more to this project. It, we spent some time towards the end of the project trying to find out whether other similar projects had been made. And yes, but to a very limited degree, normally cover, covering one year and, and very localized. I think I can safely say there's been nothing of this scale ever undertaken or completed in the history of skeptical investigation with uh, close to 4,000 predictions analyzed over a, more than two decades. It's actually a 21 year period when you uh, look, look at the entirety. I can pretty confidently say that the conclusions are, are quite sound, they're quite valid, and we didn't set out, I certainly didn't set out to, to confirm my own beliefs. I set out to see what the conclusions would be. And after a, a huge effort over with many people over all these years, the conclusion which we're pretty confident and pretty secure with is that people who claim to have psychic powers to see into the future can do no better than simply guesswork and luck. And with that, I'll invite Susan back in to see if there's any questions I can possibly answer at the moment.
That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Richard. I've seen this so many times, but it's really important that we. we oh, there you are. You're, you're right above my head. Oh, now you're next to me. Hello. Adrian did the magic. And, 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 and folks, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how important it was that Susan put together the Zoom group. If she didn't do that, the project would not have got finished because we put in thousands of hours to get this done. And everybody involved, who I thank in the credits, but they can all, you know, really take a deep breath and know they were part of one of the biggest skeptical uh, investigations Absolutely. ever this, undertaken. This had never really been done before, you guys. This was yeah. so important to to have just, it was insane. And 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 what I did, and, we, and, we it. Group, and it wasn't that, it was just, it wasn't a big deal. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I did something outrageous. It's just, you just help. The thing I tell people all the time who say, hey, what can I do to help out is show up. When yeah. somebody says I need help in this, then help, you know, if you can. So we're not going to really have time for, for questions. Uh, let's see if you can get through a couple of them. Like Linda Rosa said, did you have a favorite prediction? I think, yeah, well, too many to, to, to mention, but one that stands out is somebody predicted, coming up to the presidential election, somebody predicted that Joe Biden and Donald Trump had a chance of winning. Yeah, one or the other was going to win. <laughs> one or the other would win. <laughs> uh, Rob is saying anti-gravity. Um, yes, yes. Many questions about did somebody do better than another and that kind of thing. And I'm going to suggest that they uh, look Read at the report, the report, which is in the chat. Yeah. But yeah. but there, there were people who were a little better than others, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, depending, it's statistics. So some people had hundreds and hundreds of predictions in there. And the more we discovered, the more predictions that we could catalog from an individual, the more the score went down to 11%. So some people on paper did very well, you know, 80%, but they only had three predictions or four or five predictions. So you can't really judge. But no, I did, uh, honestly, not really. No, 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 no. I can't say that I would point to somebody and say, whoa, I think, you know, they might be onto something here. It really didn't turn out that way. Right. Uh, Eric said, do, is there been one person? Oh, oh yeah. I just asked that. I think I saw somebody say something about a statistician. I thought I saw that somewhere. No, that was me. That was me. I asked. I was mono. Yeah. Whether you had an actual professional statistician to help design the project and analyze the results because the statistics are very tricky things. Uh, no, uh, because I, this, I mean, it's all on the database. And the statistics we put out are just, you know, the basic statistics of, of our conclusions and cataloging right, wrong, correct, et cetera. And the statistics of how many questions were revolved around sport, politics, and whatever. But the, the thing is, the database is there. Somebody it's still it. sitting there and it's still ready to be harvested for all sorts of statistics, which may be a great project to look at um, maybe this year. I'm, I'm personally just putting my brain off, off this for a little while because it was so intense for so many years. I need to just stand back for a little while. But, you know, later on, we can really look at it and start really um, harvesting the statistics. I think um, our friend Kyle might even be able to offer, yeah. offer some You're advice. You're going to be on Kyle's uh, show, Data yeah. Skeptic, here. <clears throat> That's right. But, but at the moment, Mono, the, the statistics published are, are just the, the the easy, obvious ones to harvest from the database. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Lois asked, are there going to be any other Zoom-like kind of things like this? And at the moment, Richard has said he's giving it a break. And I'm yeah. giving it a break because I there was a lot of time put in it. Not that it was really difficult or anything. But um, I think that this is a valuable resource for people to meet on Zoom on a regular basis to finish yeah. projects or put together projects that are sometimes tedious and, and it's better to do as a group. So I've been looking at maybe doing doing something like this with uh, the Jerry Andrus project I'm working on, uh, archiving project. And there's, there, there's probably lots of things. And if somebody has something that they're working on and they need help with it, uh, please contact myself or Richard. Um, and no, Rob, we're not doing the Great Canadian Psychic Prediction Project. <laughs> and absolutely not. Well, what was interesting because Kyle and other people uh, would would come in and help us for the for, for a time or two, so to get an understanding, which was like Pontus Berkman, which is important. 
And I've just remembered that Rob Palmer, the well-known skeptic, also wrote a report about this whole process mm -hmm. as well. And Rob, I'll get you to put that into the chat. He already did. Oh, he already, excellent. So there are two reports you can read about it. Mm -hmm. But honestly, folks, if you want to sit back, put on some headphones and hear the lovely melodious. It did not feel like an hour whenever you guys read it. I really enjoyed um, hearing uh, it. Voice of, <laughs> not me, but uh, of Adrian Hill, her professional voice. Go golden, to this page. Golden go tonsils, we're calling it now, I think. The golden tonsils. Go to there. As I said, scroll down the page a little way, three episodes back. Sit back and listen to the whole report. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a much better understanding. All right. Thank you guys for uh, for bearing with us as long as you have. It's a long day, but I'm really enjoying myself. And I absolutely love that, Richard. You could have talked about anything. And I, I there's so <laughs> many topics you could talk about. <laughs> that would have been interesting, but I asked him to talk about this because it's it's so important because it's such a massive um, survey and uh, study, and he has done a lot of shows on as main Australian TV or radio about this. And uh, yeah. the more we get out there, the better. I mean, we got to talk this kind of thing up. That uh, this has been a let, let me interject that Richard and I are going to uh, go outside the choir. Uh, we are going to be interviewed on The Thinking Atheist this coming week. Oh, that'll be interesting. So it's great to get outside of uh, the normal skeptic choir. Anything we can do. All right, so I need to end this because we're going to go to our next speaker. But thank you again, Richard. I really appreciate you volunteering. Yeah. All the way from the other side of the world. I'm, I'm glad you're right side up. You had to fix the screen. <laughs> Otherwise, you're upside down there in Australia. We, we all can't be skeptical fairies, I tell you. We all can't just fit around the world. Uh, Michelle. All right.